Well, we're in the appendix for chapter 12, and we're looking at a situation in which a company has to figure out, well, what do we sell our product or service for? What is the right price? And we're going to look at a number of different uh, different approaches. Um, we can look at cost plus, and under cost plus, there are two types of approaches, absorption costing and total variable costing. And this is primarily for companies who are, if you remember your microeconomics at all, these are price makers. They will determine their price and set that price in the marketplace. So this means that a company pursuing either absorption costing or total variable costing has a product that can be, either through marketing or advertising, clearly differentiated from other products on the market such that the price justifies the package of values that the company is delivering to the customer. If, on the other hand, the company doesn't have a lot of pricing power and says, look, the price in the marketplace is what it is. If we price it too high, we'll never sell it. If we price it uh, uh, too low, we'll never make money on it. So we have to take whatever price is in the market, which means we must now deliver this product to the marketplace at some cost that allows us to make money. So in this situation, the company is called a price taker. And a price taker uh, is a company that uh, whose product has a lot of other substitute products in the marketplace, where it's very difficult to differentiate much beyond what's already out there, or they're in a marketplace where a product sells for a pretty pretty determined price. <clears throat> Let's take beer, uh, for example. Uh, if you're pricing a case of beer, most companies, uh, whether it be Canada or in the U.S. Or, or almost anywhere that I've seen, when they're pricing a case of beer between one brand and another and another, it's all pretty much the same price per, per, per 24 pack unless you're talking about a craft beer or a premium beer but then again that's not it's not that much further from the price but if you're going to do a middle market mass produced beer you can't just figure out well what's it going to cost us and let's sell it for that because if you're eight dollars a case over what everyone else is selling it for it's not going to sell which means you have to start with the price in the market and work your way backwards and say what must we make it for in order to sell for that price. You are a price taker versus a price maker. So let's start with the price makers because that's a little bit exciting. And we'll start with uh, cost plus absorption. And then we'll look at cost plus for total variable costing. And they should give the same price, but one of them is cleaner. One of them is easier to analyze. So let's have a look. So our cost plus, and you remember absorption costing, we spent all of most of chapter 3, chapter 4, chapter 5, process costing, job costing. The idea behind absorption costing is your inventory absorbs all the costs of manufacturing. So that when we're looking at our, our cost, uh, never mind the plus right now, but just the cost that we're going to use, it must be all of our manufacturing costs. So. A cost plus approach is a markup above our cost so that our selling price will be our cost plus our cost times some percentage of cost. The clever uh, viewer will see that the common term here is cost so we can carry that to the outside. Cost times one point something something. So let's say we want a 20% markup it would be cost times 1.20. We want a 35% markup it's our cost times 1.35. So that's the nice way to think about it. And our cost, let's be clear, is manufacturing costs only. That's the, whole, that's the whole basis of absorption costing, right, is all your manufacturing costs get absorbed into the cost of inventory. So our manufacturing costs only divided by the number of units that we're going to produce, we'll get our cost per unit times, well, our one point something something. So just the point something something, the percentage here. How do we arrive at that? Well, we want some return on our investment. Otherwise, why do it, right? So we're going to have some required ROI that we want to get. That's, that's pretty straightforward. Add to that all the non-manufacturing expenses we got to cover. Because the product cost absorbs all manufacturing costs, we must now cover all non-manufacturing costs. 
So it's all our non-manufacturing costs plus whatever money we want to make divided by, well, our cost per unit times the number of units. And the clever reader will say, but the per unit and the quantity cancels out, doesn't it? So you could just go with total cost. Yes, you can. Uh, but it's sometimes easier to work with when we can break it down into its component parts. So our required ROI is nothing more than our ROI times investment. So if it requires a million dollars to build a plant to do something and we want 20% return per year, that means we need to make at least 200000 plus cover all our non-manufacturing costs. And that will be expressed as a percentage of our cost so that we know what our percentage of cost is. Isn't that clever? Let's try an example. So let's have a look at this example. Here's a company, uh, and we've got some costs listed here. Our direct materials are $12 per unit. Direct labor is $8. We have variable manufacturing overhead of 6 with fixed manufacturing overhead of 140 Variable SG&A of $4 and fixed SG&A of 120 So we have our selling general expenses broken down into variable and fixed and our manufacturing overhead into variable and fixed. So on the absorption costing, uh, remember it's all of our manufacturing costs must be absorbed. And our manufacturing costs we can see are the top four in this list. The bottom two don't qualify. So our costs will be our direct materials plus our direct labor plus our variable manufacturing overhead plus our fixed manufacturing overhead. So we're not too concerned with the behavior of the cost. We're more concerned with the classification of the cost, all manufacturing costs. So direct materials we can see is 12, direct labor is 8, variable uh, manufacturing overhead is 6, and we have our fixed manufacturing overhead of 140,000, but for a volume of 10,000 units. We can see that that'll be $14, so we'll have 12 plus 8 is 20, plus 6 is 26, plus 14. So our absorption cost is $40. Again, it absorbs all manufacturing costs regardless of behavior, whether it be variable or fixed. If it's a manufacturing cost, in it goes. So now we're in a position to calculate our markup. And our markup, let's uh, rewrite the formula whenever you're doing problems or exercises. It is beneficial to always rewrite the formula before you enter in your variables for no other reason than it reinforces in your brain what you're doing. So it's ROI times our investment, that's the return, that's the profit we want to make, plus we want to cover all of our non-manufacturing costs, and I always just sorten it to selling general and administrative, SG&A, and we're going to divide that by our cost per unit times the quantity we expect to sell. So. If we want to make a 20% return, it is 0.2 times our investment, we're told, an investment of 200,000 times 200,000. Plus, what are all our SG&A costs? Well, we have variable SG&A and fixed SG&A. So it would be uh, $4 times 10,000 units. We've got to get that out of the way. There's the variable portion, plus the fixed component divided by our cost per unit we've already figured out is 40 bucks times the 10,000 we hope to sell. And if you multiply this through, we'll get 40,000 in this first uh, bracket plus 40,000 out of the second plus 120,000 over 400,000 which gives us 200k over 400k which equals 0.5 or 50%. So what does that mean? We got 50%. Therefore, our selling price is equal to our cost, 40, times 1.5, which equals 60. So remember, it was our cost times 1.xx, and the, the x is whatever we got here. We see that it was 0.5, we just added to 1. 40 times 1.5, $60 is our selling price. So the big thing we have to remember here, there's nothing really new. It's absorption costing. We know it's all of our manufacturing costs. So all we have to do to determine what our cost is, is, is be able to say what is a manufacturing cost, what is a non-manufacturing cost, and leave it at that. 
It gets a little tricky around the ROI. You have to remember that a percentage times the investment, uh, and, and you add your desired profit to all of your non-manufacturing costs, and you express that as a percentage of your total absorption cost, and you'll get your markup percent. There we go. Let's look at our second approach. While the first approach was absorption costing regardless of behavior of costs, this is cost plus using total variable costing. So here we don't care about the classification of cost, we care about the behavior of costs. Variable costs versus fixed costs. So that our markup percentage is pretty much the same as it was before, ROI times investment plus, instead of our total non-manufacturing costs, we're gonna use our total fixed costs divided by the quantity that we hope to sell times the unit total variable costs. In the previous example, it was the unit absorption cost. Now it's the total variable cost. So let's simplify that. It's our ROI times investment plus our fixed manufacturing overhead plus our fixed SG&A, all of our fixed costs in the numerator, divided by quantity times total variable cost per unit. So the first thing we have to do is figure out what our total variable cost is. And it will be, well, direct materials we know is variable. Direct labor we know is variable. We have a variable manufacturing overhead, and we have a variable uh, selling general and administrative. So it's the last term that changes. In absorption costings, this was the fixed manufacturing overhead. In variable costing, it's the variable SG&A instead. So we knew that was 12, that was 8, that was six. We're not going to use the fixed manufacturing overhead at all. The variable SG&A, we were told, is four. We get $30 as our cost base, not $40 as our cost base. So let's substitute that in to our equation over here. And our ROI, remember, we still want 20%. Our investment is still 200 k plus our fixed manufacturing overhead is 140 that was included in our cost last time, now it's in the numerator. Uh, plus our fixed SG&A was 120 over the same 10,000 units that we're gonna do, but this time the cost is only 30 bucks. So if you expand out the top, we get 40,000 here, plus 140 is 180, plus 120 is 300,000. And we see that the bottom is, the numerator is 300,000 as well, which equals one or 100%. So what does that mean? Therefore, our selling price equals our cost times 1.xx. But our x here is 1, so this actually turns into 2. If it were 99%, it would be 1.99, right? So as soon as we get 100%, it's just times 2, which equals 30 times 2.0, $60. We should get the same price no matter which way we work, because we are covering all our costs plus the same ROI. It's still the same 20%. So because it's just, it's just we're, we're, we're just looking at it differently. Now this way becomes much easier to figure out to, to start using things like cost volume profit analysis that we did uh, in, I believe, chapter three or chapter four, when we're looking at the behavior of costs and the impact we would have on the bottom line if we changed certain things, this lends itself to that type of analysis far better. Both methods work, depending on what your accounting system is, is working on. If you are using a, an absorption costing uh, accounting system, well, then you'll stick with that. If you're using variable costing, which we looked at uh, in chapter eight, if, we're, if you're using variable costing instead of absorption costing, well, then you would uh, follow through and use this to set your prices. Mm -hmm.